Hey everyone, it's Miss Seward. These are gonna be notes 1.2, which are terrestrial biomes, which are land biomes. The objective for today is going to be describe the global distribution and principal environmental aspects of terrestrial biomes. And today the essential knowledge that you're gonna gain is the basics of a biome, the major terrestrial biomes here on planet Earth, the global distribution, of some of the different natural resources and things that are part of these biomes. And then also the idea that biomes are dynamic and their distributions can change. And the skill that you're gonna to get to practice at the end of this is explain environmental concepts and processes. Now I briefly mentioned a biome in notes 1.1, so today we're diving more into it. And a biome is an area that shares a combination of average yearly temperatures and precipitation. That's the climate. And we've got a few different examples here. So like a rainforest is gonna be very different than a desert. And we'll dive into each of these specifically throughout these notes. Now, one thing that's really important to remember is that a community of organisms, the plants and the animals in a biome are gonna be uniquely adapted to living in that biome. For examples, camels and cacti have water preserving traits for the desert because it doesn't rain much in the desert. Um, and if you're looking at shrubs and wildflowers, they store lots of energy in their roots to recover quickly from fire in the grasslands so that if a fire comes and wipes them out, they'll be able to pop back up pretty quickly because they've stored a bunch of energy in those roots. And these are gonna be adaptations that are specific to the environment they're in those roots would not be very helpful in a desert. So these wildflowers are adapted for the grasslands and a cacti is gonna be adapted for the desert. So the first biome that we're gonna go through is the tundra. And the characteristics of the tundra is that its subsoil is frozen, like permanently all the time. There isn't much precipitation, it's really cold, there's shallow soil, which means there's pretty low productivity there's not that many plants producing anything for this environment. Now, this is going to be a graph that you are going to be seeing pretty consistently with these. It's called a, it's called a climatograph or a climate graph or a climatogram. There's kind of a few different words for it. But essentially, you're gonna see that we have precipitation on one axis and temperature on the other axes, and then on the bottom here, we've got all the months of the year. So you'll be able to see throughout the year kind of how the precipitation changes and how the temperature changes. Now you're gonna wanna pay attention to these axes labels, because as I go through the different climate graphs as we're going through them throughout these notes, some of the axes, the numbers are going to be a little bit different, so the results might look a little bit skewed if you were to just compare the graphs, but when you go and look at the actual numbers, then you'll be able to get some real data, but otherwise it's a really helpful visual to kind of show you how temperature and precipitation changes over time. So this shows low precipitation down here and generally pretty low temperatures. Like it's in the negatives and in the summers, it barely comes up to above zero degrees Celsius. Now, as I talked about, there's different adapted animals. So some major plant types that you're gonna see in this area are gonna be shrubs, lichens. There are not gonna be any trees. You don't really have the productivity. Trees are not gonna be able to survive there. Some animals are gonna be hares, Arctic fox, polar bears, caribou. And an example of where this biome occurs, it's gonna be Greenland or extreme North Canada. Now the second one is a boreal forest, which is also called a taiga. And this is gonna be what the climatogram looks like for it. And some major characteristics of a boreal forest is that it has a pretty short growing season, low precipitation, as we can see here, and you're gonna have slow decomposition because it's cold. So you've got shallow soil, low productivity. The soil isn't very helpful to have thriving plants. 
And the type of plants that you will see though, you're gonna see some pine, some spruce, animals might be moose, wolf, bear, beaver. So you are gonna get some of these trees here, but um, you're gonna have low precipitation, so it's not gonna be very high quality soil necessarily. And some examples of where you would find this, generally it's gonna be between the 50 and 60 degree north latitude, which if you think of kind of like middle Canada or Finland, that's gonna be where you're seeing boreal forests. Next, we have temperate rainforests. These are gonna be coastal areas where they are found. Not all coasts are temperate rainforests, but temperate rainforests are basically all found in coastal areas. They have high precipitation and moderate temperatures, which ends up giving us really good productivity. And since we have so much rapid plant growth though, the soil nutrient levels are actually gonna be low. You might think rainforests and lots of like high nutrients, but there's so much competition for those nutrients that actually the soil kind of gets sucked dry. But you do have high productivity. There's gonna be a lot of plant life here. And if you look at the climatogram here, you're gonna see that you have warmer in the summers, but it's not too crazy of a temperature change if you pay attention to the axes there. And then you're getting a lot of precipitation, less than the summer. Now, if this sounds familiar, you might recognize some of the animals here, like conifers, such as pines or redwoods, and animal species might be bears or banana slugs or a spotted owl. And that is because an example location would be the Pacific Northwest, right here, at least on the coastal parts. You're not gonna get this in Eastern Washington, but here we have temperate rainforests especially the Ho rainforest out on the Olympic Peninsula. That's a picture of it. So that's a temperate rainforest. Then we have temperate seasonal forest, which is also called the deciduous forest. Now what this has is warmer temperatures. So you end up having rapid decomposition because heat makes things break down and decompose faster. So there's pretty high soil nutrient levels and high productivity. Plants can thrive here, which makes it actually a prime target for agricultural development. So if you look at here, you get a decent amount of rainfall and it's pretty consistent. And then you have warmer temperatures, especially the warmer than what we were just seeing in the last couple slides here. Some of the major plant types are going to be broadleaf deciduous trees, hence why it's called a deciduous forest. And examples of these are gonna be oaks, maples, trees like that. Some animals that you'll see there are gonna be squirrels, chipmunks, bobcats, or white-tailed deer. And an example would be in New England over on the East Coast here in the United States. And we have shrubland, which is also called um, chaparral. And their productivity is limited by the summer high temperatures and low precipitation. So if you see here, it's actually not too bad in the winters. And again, if you were to zoom in and look at these, the um, axes is going to be a little bit different. So it's not like you're getting more than you originally saw in some of the past ones. It's just different axes. But you do still see you get very low precipitation in the summer, but you do get warmer temperatures. And so that sort of limits the success of plants. But the species here in the shrublands are evolved around wildfire cycles. So a lot of the plants that you're going to be seeing are drought resistant shrubs like sages or yucca plants because you don't get much rain during that time period. And some example animals you might see might be a mule deer, roadrunner, coyote, jackrabbit. This is what the shrublands are going to look like. Lots of little shrub, but not massive trees. And some examples of this are going to be the Mediterranean coast or Southern California. Next, we have temperate grasslands. Again, pay attention to those axes so that it doesn't seem alarmingly high for precipitation. Now, for the temperate grasslands, productivity, again, is limited by temperature and precipitation. And this is another one where the species evolved around re regular 
wildfire cycles. There are not going to be very many trees. In your major plant types, you're going to see lots of grasses, bison, prairie dogs. And as you can see here in the grassland, you got lots of grasses, not very many trees. An example of this would be in Oklahoma or Kansas. Those are temperate grasslands. Now we have the tropical rainforest, which has rapid plant growth, which as we learned earlier, when you have a lot of plant growth, that actually ends up meaning low soil nutrients because of the high amounts of competition. However, tropical rainforests have the most biodiversity of any terrestrial biome. There are two thirds of all terrestrial species can be found in the tropical rainforest. It has very high productivity, lots of plants. If you look here, lots of rain, warm temperatures. That's how it is in a tropical rainforest. Some of the plant types are going to be broadleaf evergreens. They get a lot of sun, they get a lot of rain, so they can stay evergreen. Some animals might be poison dart frogs, gorillas, orangutans, chimpanzee, jaguars, and some examples will be the Amazon rainforest and also the Congo basin. You see here lots of um, different plants, high productivity, various biodiversity there. Next, we have the savanna, which is tropical dry forest. So if you look here, you don't get much precipitation in the summer. You have very distinct wet and dry seasons. So if you're looking here, this is going to be a wet season. This is going to be a dry season. And there's a high decomposition rate, which means that there are fertile soils and it's really good for agriculture. However, that productivity is going to be limited by precipitation because you don't have water here in the summer. And in this area, grazing and regular wildfires tend to keep tall, large trees at bay. So if you look here, you do have some shorter trees that are existing, but if a wildfire were to go through here, it would take those out pretty quickly. And since wildfires happen so often in these type of biomes, it doesn't really let leave long enough time for these trees to get really tall. So the major type plants that you're going to see are broadleaf grasses. And the savanna is going to be where you find animals like zebras, lions, elephants, or rhinoceros. And an example of this would be in the Serengeti. And then we have the desert which it's known for its very high temperatures and very low precipitation. Producti productivity, plant life is limited by precipitation. So if you're looking at a graph here, as I said, high temps, low rainfall. The type of plant types that you're gonna find here are gonna be cacti and succulents, and some animals might be a camel, a kangaroo rat, or a scorpion. So if you look here, you do not have big, tall trees. You've got cacti. And you've got uh, plants that are able to hold in water for the long spells without rain. Some examples of these would be the Sahara Desert or the Mojave Desert. Now, if you go and you look at kind of all of these together, you can start to look at the biome characteristics. So the biomes are going to be defined by their annual temperature and their precipitation average. And these charts can also help to predict where on earth biomes are found. So if you look at this diagram right here, you're going to notice that you start to see them along similar latitudes. Up here is where we have the tundra. Then we've got the boreal forest here. Kind of in the middle-ish is where you're going to be seeing that grassland. Down here is where you're going to get the tropical rainforest and the tropical seasonal forest or the savanna. Now, one of the things that I recommend with biomes, do not necessarily go and just memorize all of the slides that I just showed you. You aren't going to remember every single detail on the AP test, and it's also just not a very helpful way to learn. So one of the important things with biomes is to start to look for the patterns and to learn why we see biomes being the way that they are. So for example, 
if we're looking at the tundra or boreal forest, they're at higher latitudes up here, like high up. Then if you go to temperate, they're kind of in the middle latitudes, kind of around 30 to 60 degrees. And then tropical is going to be right down by the equator. So if you start to think about the characteristics of these biomes, then you can start thinking about it almost in relation to the equator. What do you have at the equator? You got lots of sunshine. So you've got sunshine, you've got warmth, lots of photosynthesis can be happening here. That's why you're having a lot of plants, that high productivity. Now, as you move farther from the equator, you're going to get less of that warmth. You're also going to get less of the rains. The equator, it rains a ton there. So as you move north, if you compare the equator to like up at the tundra, they have low precipitation and low temperatures because they're far away from the equator. So you start to think of it in patterns and then you'll be able to kind of use those patterns to make sense of, oh, okay, this is why we start to see some of these characteristics and patterns at these certain latitudes, because in relation to the equator and the type of precipitation or temperature that it's missing. Now, latitude is going to determine temperature and precipitation, which is why biomes exist in predictable patterns on Earth. Another pattern, especially when we're looking at the plants and animals that are related to these biomes, is going to be nutrient availability. So plants need soil nutrients in order to grow. They also need sunshine. So the availability of some of those plant nutrients are going to determine which types of plants can survive in a certain biome. So for example, a frozen tundra is not going to allow nutrients from dead organisms to be broken down because it's frozen. It's cold. Everything's stuck in ice. It's not decomposing, which means you're not getting nutrients seeping into that soil there. So you're going to have low soil nutrients, low water because it's frozen. And so few plants are going to be able to survive there in the tundra. If you were to look at the soil here, this active layer that is going to be the actual little bit of soil. And then this right here is just your like totally frozen ice block. So you can see there's not much available here for plants. You're not going to have trees with massive roots growing here. As you can see, no trees. Now, if you're going to go and look at this nutrient availability in a tropical rainforest, you are going to have poor soil nutrients because of the high competition, not because it's not decomposing, but because so many plants are competing there. Boreal forest, it's going to be nutrient poor because it's lower temperatures, which means lower decomposition of dead organisms. And dead organisms is how you're going to go and get that into the soil. And then temperate forests, those are nutrient rich. You have so much leaves coming down during the fall. So you have lots of dead organisms. You have a lot of decay. There's warmer temperatures. There's moisture. It can all decompose as it should in order to get that nutrients into the soil. So when you think in the terms of nutrient availability, that's also going to help you start thinking about the plants. So you aren't necessarily going to memorize every little plant and animal that I just showed you, but if you know the basics of a tropical rainforest because you know it's at the equator, you realize there's lots of plants, lots of competition, so kind of poor soil nutrients. If you're aware of the tundra and how it's really far from the equator, you're going to be able to say, all right, I know trees can't go there because they aren't going to be able to thrive. And that's going to be the type of patterns and recognition that you can use to kind of work through the types of plants and animals that might be found in these biomes instead of just memorizing every animal or plant that might be found there. Now, one thing to mention is the idea that biomes do shift. They shift in location on Earth as climate changes. So, for example, a warming climate, which we have seen consistently over the past decades, a warming climate is going to shift 
boreal forests further north as tundra permafrost starts melting. And then the lower latitudes become too warm for aspen and spruce. So we see these biomes shift. So if you look at the basically current breakdown of where these boreal forests have been found, and then based on scientific data of how temperatures are warming, we are seeing this shift that the predicted rate of change of temperatures over the next hundred years, this is where the boreal forests are expected to be in about a hundred years because the temperatures are warming, the ice is melting, which means the soil is going to be soil that these trees can move up into. And in fact, we are already seeing this. This is a picture from the exact same place over about 40 years. So if you look here in 1962 at this boreal forest, and then you look about 40 years later, you can actually see these trees coming in and moving farther north. And that's what they're doing. If you're standing and looking at north, that's moving towards you. So you can already see some of the shifting happening in the past few decades. So now what we're gonna do is you are going to have your practice FRQ question. And what I want you to do is to identify one characteristic of a biome and explain how that characteristic determines the community of organisms found in the biome. Well, that's it for notes 1.2 on terrestrial biomes. Hopefully this was helpful.